Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are here in beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, with Mr. Robert Nunez. Robert, thanks so much for, for having us. Uh, yeah, thanks having for us uh, Robert is the uh, principal tubist of the, of the Louisiana Philharmonic and uh, teaches at Tulane University. And uh, we're so happy to uh, have you with us. He also had some studies with Mr. Jacobs. And so I'm just wondering if you can recount for us uh, what led you to Mr. Jacobs' door in the first place? Yeah, well, I had studied, I'm from New Orleans area, and I had studied with the former tuba player, uh, Neil Tidwell. Um, and he was the principal tuba player from about 1967 to 1989 when New Orleans Symphony went under, unfortunately. So my first uh, introduction of Jacobs' concepts was through uh, Neil Tidwell, actually. And uh, uh, he was one of the, uh, in the first Chicago Symphony audition for Jacobs' chair, uh, he was in, 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 I think, the top nine or something. Yeah, one of the finals. And, yeah, and um, anyway, uh, he's a great player, great person. He's, he passed away about four years ago, unfortunately. But, um, <clears throat> and then later on, um, with the former uh, bass trombonist Dick Erb, who then went on to Louisiana Philharmonic. So I worked with Dick Erb later on in Louisiana Philharmonic and studied with him some and got more... <laughs> of Jacob's concepts through him as well. So it wasn't until I actually had the job in New Orleans after like maybe 1992 that I went to Jake. Of course, that's, you know, not too many years before he passed away, but uh, I studied with him from probably 1992 to about when he passed 1998 away. 1998 so. Yeah. And, you know, when he was able to, it, I think at the end there, he probably taught a little less, but um, <clears throat> anyway, so, and I remember the first lesson, uh, of course, you sat. There was a chair outside the the, uh, the his office in the Fine Arts Building, yep. but that William Shatner uh, School of Acting, which nobody ever came out the door. <laughs> I was just just you know I was watching for somebody to come out, and that never happened. So yeah. I just remember the first time, just memories. Uh, he opened the door and says, "Whoa, they're growing big down there," you know. And, uh -huh. and, and he was short. I couldn't believe how short. You know, you have this preconception of what he's going to look like and sound like, and. <laughs> We should let the audience know that you are above average in height. Yeah, I'm six five. Yeah, actually, yeah, and um, and so, <laughs> so yeah, Jacobs is probably about five eight, five nine. Right, he was, yeah. you know, fairly short. You know, I was, I didn't have any idea how tall he was, you know, and uh, of course I was super nervous, even as a professional, you know, going in there, you know, you, you everybody wants to try to impress him. Well, you know, he. <laughs> Pretty, uh, he had me said, warm up, go ahead and warm up. So I started with a pretty pathetic warm up, you know. And uh, right away he says, uh, you're not setting very high standards. So he put me in my place right away. But, you know, I found that everything he said was very truthful, you know. And, and he was right on the money about everything he told me uh, artistically. And so uh, shortly, like a couple of lessons later, he started having me play out of the Charlier book. Um, a French horn books. He told me to buy the pate. Yep, uh, yep. And uh, but you know, I found that working with him on, and as he always talked about, just working on general music uh, instead of just specific, you know, Remington exercise or something. He really wasn't interested in hearing, but general music and um, telling me to sound like Herseth. Well, how would Herseth phrase this on Charlier? You know, yeah, right. and I found that. <laughs> But in the process, you know, it made me a lot better player and had me thinking on a, on a, a new uh, level you know, of artistry. And so I, I was loving that because he was pushing me a lot on everything, you know. And of course, I wanted to work on excerpts with him. Yes, of course. But he kind of, <laughs> he says, you know, you want those excerpts, but you really need to work on, on these other artistic, you know, these, these etudes and so forth. So I'm glad he pushed me in that direction, though because it really made a big difference in my life and my career, you know. Yeah, it was about the music first. Yeah. And out of the music would flow the excerpts. And uh, I saw some of your other interviews, of course, but people talking about the mouthpiece for him, you know, he had me go buy one. He was selling products out of, there was a little side office um, or room, I guess. Next door. Yeah, 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 and he had me go over there and buy a different breathing bag and the, and the visualizer. I mean, they call it the visualizer, but Really, it was about lip vibration, singing with your lips. You know, right. he went through all that stuff, flesh and blood read. But once I started work with that that rim, I, I said, "Boy, this is really improving my sound." 
and, and, the, and the, getting the lip vibration. I just thought that was a whole new way of thinking about it that I had never really thought about, you know, the way he was describing it. Mm -hmm. And then another lesson, I think it was the third lesson I went to, um, Floyd Cooley was playing ahead of me. I didn't know it at the time, so I'm sitting outside <laughs> waiting to go in, and I hear this incredible playing going on, something really, a modern piece, you know, and he was yeah. just really ripping it up great, you know, it sounded awesome. And I said, my God, I have to follow this person, but I didn't know it at the time. So he opened the door and he says, oh, you know Floyd, don't you? So Floyd Cool is one of my heroes growing yeah, up, you know, yeah. uh, uh, listening to all of his solo CDs. And yeah. that's what I told Jacobs. I said, well, yes, I know him. I have all of his recordings, you know. So that was pretty humbling. But uh, Floyd Cool was very nice. He was asking me about my tuba bag or something. He made me feel at ease. You know, he knew I was a little mm -hmm. tight, but <laughs> it's, it's a good memory. I actually had one of those lessons, too. I, I yeah. didn't know I had Floyd preceded me. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, it was. It was pretty funny. Yeah, and uh, that was the time I think he was playing that year in Chicago. Right. Yeah, and so uh, before he started teaching at DePaul, I believe, right later, a little later. But uh, that was uh, a memorable time. And also, um, I remember. Um, well, he didn't really have me work too much on the breathing machines that he had. I think the, one of the ones with the tank was broken at the time or something. Yeah, he talked okay, about yeah. Charlie Vernon using yeah, it right. or something. He said, he's always in here and he's messing with this. And yeah. I said, oh, okay. But he did have me work on other aspects of, of you know, respiratory function. And, you know, he really spurred me to learn more about it, mm -hmm. too. You know, just his, his knowledge of it was incredible, of course. And he was, just, he was you know, that, that term he used, palpate, mm -hmm. <laughs> to touch. And he would, you know, he'd make sure that, you know, you were doing all the things just naturally instead of trying to manipulate the physical. And, and as he always talked about, just put the meter right here at the lips. That's what he was telling me. And so I thought that, you know, it was just a new, con the new concepts, and I was overwhelmed. You say put the meter at the lips? Me he said the meter meaning the wind. Oh, okay. Don't yeah. internalize. Put the wind at the lips. Right. Gotcha. That's what he meant by that. He didn't want me to try to meet or other aspects of the physical, and so that and he and he talked about posture. You know, just every time I'd come back, my my colleague Dick Erb was in the orchestra for a long time. He retired eventually, but he'd say, "Oh, you always you sound better." You know, I was sitting up a lot straighter, not leaning back, and, and I was getting a lot more wind yeah. to use. You know, and uh, just so many aspects that he really introduced to me. That I mean, it really changed my life in terms of playing. You know, at a, at a higher level of yeah. excellence, and he talked about that. You know, the, the level of excellence and so forth. So, I was just, I felt it was a privilege to just be able to walk in there once. You know, but I got several opportunities to, to get the information. Eventually, he let me uh, record. It wasn't for like maybe two or three lessons he would, yeah. <laughs> and then he said, "Okay, you go ahead and do that." You know, so I started recording. And I take notes. Yep. On everything, you know, and I still have those notes. I go back and reference those notes sometimes just to remind myself if I'm steering the wrong way or something, yeah. you know, yeah. in performance or teaching even, you know. Robert, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned that uh, Jacobs had you go out and get a visualizer. Um, what did he have you do with it? Did he give you instructions or what was it, the point of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, the visualizer is a bit of a misnomer because really what he was using that for I think more than just seeing what you were doing was the lip vibration and he talked about singing with the lips you know which is new to me and he said you know it's like a flesh and blood read we have to get the vibratory rate going and all this kind of stuff so see he would I would buzz on that he would just do pop goes the weasel or something he'd have me do it you know and just emphasizing the, uh, you know seeking out this lip vibration more vibratory rate you know, and, and getting, and then when you put that in the resonator, the horn, mm -hmm. you know, he'd talk about all this, of course, in depth and much better than I can explain it. Uh, you know, the resonance then was incredible. You know, I found in my own playing that after I worked on that rim and got the lip vibration going, you know, uh, that was key and, and, and great tonal, you know, the sound of the instrument. So the instrument's just, you know, resonator, he talked about all that, you know, the, the instrument's really not important, you know. <laughs> He says, this is what's important, what you're feeding here, and the concept, you mm -hmm. know. And so he talked about the seventh cranial nerve, you know. Tube in the mind. Yes. And he, it. yeah, he talked about, he told me, yeah, use your voice a great deal. And he went into solfege a little bit, but I'm not very good at solfege. So he just had me sing the names of the notes at one point, you know. Right. 
but he was he was teaching me on so many levels you know and it took a while to get all this uh, solidified in my brain you know it takes you a while to get the concepts and process everything but once you have that you know it, it things start happening for you in, in, in a great way and sometimes it doesn't happen right away you know it might take you three weeks a month or two you know you, it just depends on the concept you know right so that was yeah so that mouthpiece room he sent me over to the little room the lady yeah, yes yeah it was very nice and yeah. she would she sold me the breathing bag yeah. and then the ram he and sent she, me she over had there the, she had the spirometers too yes for uh, yeah for a i bought one of those yeah yeah and he had me do that in the lesson uh for breathing uh the the, the woldine spirometer and sound mm -hmm. spirometer mm -hmm. and uh he'd have me breathe through that and play meister singer you know but it always sounded better every time and would you would you uh blow into it while you were playing Meister Singer, maybe on the mouthpiece or He had me do that once. Okay. And he also had the other one with the ping pong ball that yeah. you would I think I played into that one. Yeah. He, and he right. would turn it upside the down inspiration. and different and do different breathing a lot of different things. Yeah. So the Voldine when with, with reference to the Meister Singer, just using that to really mm -hmm. suck in air and then use that air. Yeah. And he, a, he was trying to get, get my mind off of all the internal parts, which were incorrectly taught when we were young by many I mean, there were well-meaning instructors in the past. Yeah, they course. just didn't have the knowledge that he had of respiratory function. Right. You know, so, yeah. So he was correcting a lot of problems, but he's trying to get me off the internal and thinking external, you know, and, and yeah. sucking all the air in the room. He just used different analogies, you know, and so forth. He was trying to get you to go to the control panel rather than go to the individual parts of the machine. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, it's like, you know, he described, you know, you're trying to move this diaphragm this way and it doesn't work that way. You know, he, he would give you some information and he had a chart at the time when I was there, he had a chart of the body, you know, and just hanging <laughs> up there. Yeah. It's in that picture I have of yeah, with him. Yeah, Thin Man, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he'd talk about that and, and how, you know, it's, it's all natural, you know, and, and you're trying to manipulate that which does not need to be manipulated mm -hmm. and so forth. So, With the visualizer, yeah. did you notice, uh, did it take a while to become accustomed or did you, were you good at it right away? How, oh, how I wasn't good at it right away, no. Uh, it took me a little while to, you know, work with it. And then st and I started getting more vibration and then I'd pick up the mouthpiece. And you know, he told me not to do too much on the visual on one yeah session maybe two or three minutes or yeah. something he'd tell me and then put it down and go back to the mouthpiece of the horn so and then even when I went to the mouthpiece after working on the rim I could tell there was more vibration I was getting better sound on the mouthpiece so it was it was a progression over time and I, I noticed the, the difference you know I recorded myself a lot and I still do and uh, I could hear you know I'd even do that on the recording just to hear <laughs> the difference in the vibratory rate and yeah so it was it was. It took me a little while to to work with the rim, but once I got that going, I'd bring it back to lessons with me. You know, he'd have me do it again, and it just as a reminder. And I mean, I still do that. And I remember Dick Herb. Uh, 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 he had one on a string or something. He'd bring it to work, <laughs> and so he'd buzz on a little bit, put it in his pocket. You know, it was yeah. kind of funny, but he was doing the same thing. Reminder, yeah. a great reminder. Yeah, you know? yeah, so. definitely. Robert, I'm wondering, you mentioned uh, Jacob's working with you, um, you know, respiratory function and that sort of thing. I mean, you're a tall person. Uh, I don't know what your lung capacity is, but I'm sure it's way above average uh, than most people. Um, you can play long phrases with a half a breath, but that's, yeah. he probably talked about that. He, yeah, well, he also talked about as you get older, you start losing the elasticity of your lung tissue. Yeah. <laughs> He talked to me about that, and I think I'm starting to feel that a little bit now. So I do have to take a little more frequent breaths, you know. I probably had six. I don't think I was that exceptional, but six was probably the top of what I had. But what he did tell me was that when I first went to him that I was, you know, I was starving myself of air, meaning I wasn't taking enough air and using that wind, you know. And I had a lot more capacity than I was taking advantage of. And, you know, he said, you don't want it to be painful. You go too far, hyperextend, and, yeah. and but but he said I wasn't getting anywhere near eighty percent full. You know, I might have been taking thirty or forty to play Meister Singer or whatever. So that's when he incorporated the the incentive spirometer, which he had me purchase, you know, uh, next door. And uh, once he would have me uh, take in the air through that, and then play, let's say Meister Singer or something low with great flow rate. You know, he talked about uh, you know interoral pressure, <laughs> and um, you know, if your armature is a little bit too tight, how the interval pressure is higher, and, and, 
and he would talk about the equalization process of, of respiratory function, the, the internal versus external, always trying to equalize. Mm -hmm. you know, he, would ex he would explain a lot of details so you had that information, but uh, he would emphasize when you're doing it, you don't want to think about any of that. You, you want to just make it a very natural process, which it is. And I think a lot of band directors still, that I, I work with some in this area, I, some of them are open minded and let me explain some of this that I learned from Jacobs, mm -hmm. you know, which is actually helping their band program. So, in a way, Mr. Jacobs still lives, you know, his concepts still live because we're all putting that information out there, his students, you know, yeah. and it's actually helping a lot of wind and brass players. So, his ideas are still out there, and they, of course, we know they work, <laughs> right? You know, and some band directors, the smart ones, are uh, taking advantage of that. And so, and getting back to my problem so I wasn't taking in enough wind just generally and even though I had that pretty good capacity you know so my playing was suffering as a result I wasn't getting the the, the resonance that I wanted the, and the vibratory rate that I wanted it, it just wasn't there but after working with him um, several lessons you know we spent on a good amount on respiratory function breathing and he had me thinking in a whole new way but not internalizing you know and so I even had the, the breathing bag, rebreather bag, and he had me, I think that one was six liters. I was able to fill that one up pretty comfortably. Pretty easily. Know? Yeah, and... Um, Did but, you get it to kind of blow up like a balloon in a way? Oh, uh, no. no? I, I, I really think I was at six. Okay. You know, that was my top. Even okay. though I'm a big guy, I don't think I have. And he talked about different somatotypes. Yep, <laughs> different body types. Yeah, he yeah, said some, some people surprise you sometimes. You know, they may look small or whatever, but they, can, they have seven liters, you know, and... He, he talked about that a little bit with me too, yeah. Yeah, he, 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 he as I understand it, um, he really got interested in that when in the 50s, Will Scarlett, who eventually went on to play trumpet in the say right. so, yeah. Scarlett as a student came in and was like five foot seven or so, mm. and he had six and a half liters of air. Mm. And the charts said he's supposed to have maybe three and a half or four. Right, right. And so he was, what is going on? And so that's when he started his whole research project into body shapes. Right, right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I remember seeing that chart in one of the books, uh, I think the one that he did with Brian yeah, Frederick. Right. Yeah, and he has that chart, which yeah. you're supposed to have, I think maybe it has age as well. It has age, gender, and height, but there's yeah. no there's no somatotype. And so right, the, right. The, different, the different body shapes just uh, a wasn't general, representative. Yeah. He couldn't get any of that information from the medical community, so he started to keep track on his own. That's, that's amazing. Right? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that he had put that together. Yeah. So, I so get a, uh, getting uh, you just, do you remember what it was like uh, in that lesson uh, when, when he had you taking a full breath and then you started to play? Oh, yeah. What, well, what Meister like? Singer was a good example. You know, he had me taken through the Voldine incentive spirometer, you know, and I was, then I was getting full breaths in, so I'd play it. And of course, the sound was just much better. You know, upper register, everything was easier. You know, we let the wind do the work up there. Yeah, it the just it soars. You know, it just happens, and and it sounds much better. Yeah. And so yeah, I mean, it was a huge difference. Of course, then I was I think I was he allowed me to tape at that point, so I could hear a different difference before and after. You know, I'd play it, and he had me do some breathing exercises with that, and then I'd play it again. He'd have me breathe in. He would hold it. I'd breathe in, and I'd play it, and right away, you know, boom. It's just a huge difference. Yeah. So I, I still do that with h even high school kids I teach, and you know, I'll sit there and <laughs> breathe through that and have them play, and it every time sounds better. You know, it might take a few of them a little longer. It just depends on the person. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I learned a lot from that, and I still use it, and I still do it myself as a reminder. Did he have you uh, w w play on the mouthpiece or on the visualizer? Uh, did he have you do drills or? Tunes or what was it that he wanted you to? You know, he, he really wasn't drills per se. It was just tunes. And he would have me play America, um, Pop Goes the Weasel. It, it really didn't matter. It was it was the, you know just the going through musical thought processes. You know, uh, conception. You know, he talked a lot about imagining what you want things to sound like, and then getting this to respond reflexly. You know, and I, I remember that one it was a great lesson because I didn't really understand all all that work, but. And he, that's when he went into talking about singing and the importance of conceiving and singing while you play, you know, sing while you play and, and storyteller of sound. He told me that, and I know he told a lot of people that, but he told me that too in a lesson. And um, 
it all stuck with me, you know, it, it made, as I got older, it all made more sense, too, you yeah. know, when you figure it out a little bit, you know, and that can actually help you help younger people in a, better, you know. Yeah, I mean, in, in the lesson itself, I don't know about for you, but for me, it was definitely, there is a lot of information coming at me at, at yeah. this point in time, and yeah. I am just sitting here saying, I'm just nodding, <laughs> and then you go back and listen to the tape, or you read your notes later, and then you start to... You, know, you start sorting it out slowly, you know, and, and, and the concepts come, you know, and, and when it does, it's even, it just confirms what we already know about it even more, you know, that these things do still work, and he spent a lot of time, I mean, he's an exceptional mind, you know, he could have been, uh, uh, didn't he study to be, was he studying to become a doctor? He, he, he was he, interested in it. He was a very interested from child, I, it, as a youth, because yeah. like, his legs were not, yeah, uh, were somehow compromised, I don't know mm -hmm. the exact. Yeah. So, but I remember I had to help him up to take a picture with him one time. Yeah. He was, you know, he was up in age then. But yeah. I, yeah. But he, and I remember asking about this, this one long uh, rumor that went. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I had to ask yeah. him, you know. Yeah. And he said, oh, he just started laughing, you know. He said, oh, that's not true. I just have other problems and bronchitis and this and that. And he had that inhaler he used yep. to take out and puff. And he told me, oh, you're going to get one of these. And he started, you know, it opens things up. It's like, well, maybe the doctor says, okay, you know. Uh, my, I think my first lesson with him in 1981, I, I asked him, is it true that you only have one lung? Yeah. And he laughed. And he says, no, no, I have two, just limited yeah. use. Yeah. Not yeah. both of them. But, That's uh, basically what he told me. I'm sure yeah. everybody asked him that. Because there are people who ask me about that because they, oh, you study with Arnold Jacobs? One said, yeah. Well, one, no, that's not true. I asked them myself. So I have to describe to them, you know. Isn't that amazing? Uh, you know, how, how of all the things that can be said about Jacobs, that's one of the headliners in the consciousness of people who may know something about him. You know, he's the guy with one lung. Yeah, it should be. It should be all the other great things, he, the concepts he came up with. <laughs> Instead it's so of that. interesting to figure out where yeah. that exactly started. Oh, it's just a rumor that flies around. You yeah. know how that is, and and anything. Yeah. Well, Robert, it's so great to finally meet you. Yeah, great to and, meet you, Mike. Uh, to uh, come down to New Orleans. This is my first time in New Orleans. Yeah. So had a beignet. Couple of beignets this morning. For awesome. Breakfast. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? Yeah. I do <laughs> a lot of powdered sugar, yeah. Um, but uh, Puddles, uh, as always, he always encourages me to to bring a thank you gift. And so we have this brand new wow. limited edition TPTV, that's Tuba People TV, okay. uh, water bottle for you as a okay. oh, token thank of, you. Our, Appreciate of it. our thanks for. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Puddles. Taking part, he says you're welcome. He says you're number one. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate so, that. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Yep. And now back to you. <laughs>